<laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, um, I guess we're just hanging around for a bit while we wait for people to join. But we are here. So, I guess what we might do is a little bit of meditation while we're waiting. That's not doesn't have to be real meditation, so you can get enlightened without trying with this one. So, so just, just, just enjoy this moment. So just uh, feeling the time, feeling what it's like to be here. Hearing the sounds of the world. Uh, you know the, the old Taoist thing of like... Um, that's what we're here for, to hear the sounds of the world, to be. Being trumps just about any of our other goals. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Linji would say, I'm just someone with nothing to do. So uh, for the moment of the meditation, we can let the universe teach us all that stuff, you know. Look after us, embrace us, comfort us. Just feeling the expansiveness of the moment. And it's a great thing to be here. For as long as we're here, it's great to be here. <laughs> and uh, what's the best moment? This moment is always the best moment. <laughs> so there's, there's that. After all these years, now is still the best moment. <laughs> it's like, uh, do you like my new haircut? It's like that question. <laughs> There's only one answer. <laughs> do you like this moment? <laughs> so yeah. And just feel it. What is it here? Here we are. You know, absorbing, honoring, feeling. It's nice to have that time when ah, uh, your only obligation is to have this life, to feel life, to honor life by being it. Being inside life and life is inside us. We're enjoying ourselves. So that was the beginning meditation. <laughs> and uh, while well, we're all coming on, a few people are probably still coming on, but good enough. So I, I've been thinking about uh, the sounds, hearing the sounds of the world is what, um, if you're in a traditional chant system, and then <clears throat> you go to hell, <laughs> then um, the person who will help you out is Guan Shi Yin. Her name means hearing the sounds of the world. And so it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, I think. It, there's something about um, uh, what do we do for the world? You know, we, we experience it, we let it come to us. Uh, we we keep company with the world. Even before we push it around, we listen to it before we start manipulating it and so on. And uh, of course, you know, we're always trying, you know, doing our best and learning things and doing things. But there's something about letting the world fill us and then we're not holding bits of it away and denying bits of it. And so then there's a kind of joy and energy that fills us, you know, because we're not holding off the dark bits, not holding off the shadow. And uh, hearing the sounds of the world. <clears throat> and you notice when you're listening, if you just listen for a bit, <clears throat> there's usually something going on, even if, you know, the hum of the city or the very faint, noise of your blood pressure, 
little corpse corpuscles racing around their racing track inside <laughs> and <laughs> and i think the the thing is to accompany each other and to, to hear the sounds of the world means to hear the sounds of each other and that means accompanying and so it may not even if it's not sounds it might be some other thing you're accompanying um i mean the you know i discovered this most people have known someone who was dying or being close to someone who's dying and been with them and and you know it's, it's a great the great thing that teaches if we can listen is just to be here that nothing is required of us except our accompanying hearing the sounds uh, so that's the the bodhisattva of mercy and delight to hear the sounds and then you can have um you know quite a good time with someone who's dying because at the moment they're not dying they're being with a friend and i remember having a long lunch with the poet phil whalen uh, and uh, i just went down to see him and it was very hard, hard to get to see him because he was in a tiny little hospice and there was no one tending the door <clears throat> so i just kept banging until somebody came you know? <laughs> and um some guy said oh we're not open and looked at me like wildly and then disappeared and so i just walked in the door <laughs> he was great he looked looked like an elf you know and uh, <laughs> he's clearly with some friend of his who was dying i guess and anyway i went up to, and i had to go in and look in all the rooms and open doors and things and uh, found phil whalen the poet and um i don't know if a poet's the best description of him but he was a polymath you, know, you could talk to him about anything and he would know something about like tell me about 15th century poetry in italy you know you would just you just like turning on a faucet you know <laughs> tell, me, tell me about whatever it was anyway and uh, i remember oh and he knew everybody i remember being in visiting him in hospital when he had um deli uh delirium after a, a heart procedure and he it was really a mishandling of his meds but which uh, but he got through it but anyway he, him having a long conversation with me and um, jack kerouac and some other other long dead people you know. <laughs> and, uh, and he was just uh, it was great i knew my name was john but he thought i was somehow contemporary with those other people <laughs> which was good so so hearing the sounds of the world and just listening and hearing and the thing to be you know the, the good thing the only thing you could possibly ever be with him was to accompany him you know um and you couldn't intervene making him feel better he was too smart for that you know and uh, and he, he wasn't really feeling bad in the first place he was just dying <laughs> so, you know, so 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 you it's so something to remember about hearing if you really hear the sounds of the world you hear what people are up to and so there are a lot of stories about people wake awakening with um sound you know train whistles are popular someone hears a train whistle and they say oh my god i get it now this is what the car was about <laughs> so well, it's really more like something comes over you and just really not because you're working hard on your coins because you're just open to the world at that moment uh elsa atwell who's here i think had one of her experiences with the, the train the lonely sound of the train going north in santa barbara you know a great sound Joan Sutherland had this experience where she was coming back from Zendo in Los Angeles and she was in a very driving through a very messed up area kind of like uh sort of area you wouldn't want to walk through and uh and she was sick and so all those unfavorable conditions 
in a way made her open perhaps you know so anyway and she heard a the radio was playing and interrupted for an advertisement for a soap opera in which somebody shot somebody else if i can't have it have him you can't either bang 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 and that moment, that was her awakening moment <laughs> i mean it was kind of great <laughs> so, <laughs> In other words, you step out of all the ways you're constructing the world and, and it's all there. You're hearing the sounds of the world, receiving the sounds of the world. So that's why bells are great for that in the Zendo. That <clears throat> we don't sort of resist it. We don't go out and make it something. It's just here. And, uh, the owl and the bell open the silence. So, yeah. And I think there's another way. There are many ways of listening, of course, but um, the um, one of the, the women, Guan, one of the old uh, classic Zen texts, Koan texts, goes, uh, there's a, a line in it saying, you see, with your ears and hear with your eyes. You will see with your ears and hear with your eyes. And we kind of know what he means, you know? When we feel just free and we step out of ourselves, um, oh, it's like that. And in some ways we might say, oh, a friend of mine uh, uh, did a lot of research on synesthesia and meditators and psychiatrists and you see you have one. And uh, he found that indeed meditators have a lot more synesthesia than other people. Uh, in that, you know, uh, the days of the week have colors and things like that. Uh, or you, you, you hear an emotion, something like that. So, but I think it's just also, it's not just classic, which is a neurological thing, cl the classic synesthesia. I think it's just that we're open to hearing the sounds of the world in different ways. And uh, uh, and so, and our whole being is, is involved. Um, one of the, 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 I think it's a, a story maybe, I'm not sure where the story's from, but might be from uh, Paul Rips's book on uh, collected Zen stories, which he collected from a Zen teacher, a, Cohen teacher called Nyogen Sensaki, who was one of the first uh, Cohen teachers in California. And uh, and he was interned during the war, and he was um, <clears throat> during the Second World War, and he was the had the only meditation dojo in the United States during the Second World War, <laughs> which was at in uh, in a prison camp. And and I knew I know I know knew, used to know people. Increasingly, don't who sat with who who as children were there and would sometimes wander in and sit with him. So, um, uh, you have to hear the sounds of the world. So, this is one of Sensaki's stories. And so, there's a guy who's a tremendous musician, and every time he played, he played a stringed instrument, and every uh, shamisen, and every time he played. He would have a friend sitting on stage with him. And people would ask the guy, well, what do you do? And he said, I listen. <laughs> and, uh, and they were just really close friends. And when you saw one, you tended to see the other. But, um, and, uh, and he said, but what do you do? And he said, I listen. That's what I do. <laughs> so if you ask, what do you do with this world? I listen to the sounds of the world. I hear the sounds of the world and they come in and they touch me and it changes everything when you hear the sounds of the world. And so uh, the musician, uh, musicians at one stage, the musician's friend, friend died and then he just didn't give public concerts anymore because he said, I, nobody's listening to me. <laughs> it's like, other people say they're listening, but my friend is not. I need my friend, you know. So, and there's something about what we do for the world, I think, there, when we really, you know, you just see some kid in the street and you witness them. 
you don't have that impatient thought about they should be behaving better or they're in danger and I should look after you don't none of that you just witness them yeah so you can tell the other thing about hearing the sounds of the world is not to bother the world not to not to make other want other people to feel differently or thinking Susan Murphy at <clears throat> the Zen teacher in Australia has this great saying don't bother the traffic you know so <laughs> which pretty much means uh, anything anybody else is feeling you know I I have a friend who's um who teaches and uh, he um he asks you to tell he asks you about something you start telling him he says oh yes and gives a comment and then says oh yes and gives a comment and I said well what are you doing and he said well I'm trying to make everybody feel better but <laughs> did it occur to you that you're stopping anything from happening <laughs> that he can't you know he can't bear to have things go along without him managing them so you can tell that hearing the sounds of the world is actually not to manage the world not to to trust the world to manage itself and that's a tremendous act of kindness really yeah um and 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 even then it goes into your own mind you trust your own mind to manage itself when you're meditating You know, there's a great old uh, saying in a sutra that says, don't raise delusive thoughts. Very good. And it says, when delusive thoughts have appeared, <laughs> don't get rid of them. <laughs> so that's that, don't bother the traffic, you know, just the traffic. You don't oppose or find fault with what you're hearing. Um, and uh, and so that, that's the thing also to do when someone's in difficulties. You know, that's that thing with like uh, Phil Whalen. I don't know if he was in difficulties really. He was kind of, he was kind of blind. So that was hard for him because he couldn't, he liked to read, you know, but um, he listened to music a lot then. But, um, but yeah, so not interfering with someone's state. When he was introducing me to Jack Kerouac in a hospital ward, Laguna Honda, I said, Thank you. I'm glad to meet your friend Jack. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, um, and uh, and I had a I had another friend who who had sort of gotten gotten a fair way actually on um, in the Cohen work and had a, an awakening experience, but she just knew it wasn't kind of enough for her. You know, probably would have been enough for other people because the teacher said, "Oh, it's all right. You go. You can answer the questions I'm asking you. Yeah, good." And she thought, oh, no, no. she said, I'm still not completely at ease, you know, and she could tell that. And so it didn't matter if she impressed everybody. So that was a kind of nice, honorable thing. And um, she didn't want to be tender to something that she didn't feel easy about. And so I remember when I was uh, <coughs> running a temple in Honolulu, then she would sit in the very back when you know out of the action completely most people didn't want to sit there because you know you couldn't necessarily it was hard to hear the talks and things like that but uh, but she was way out way in the back there and she had a window open and she was listening to the birds and she had such a sweet expression on her face she just she always had her eyes closed and just be listening and listening and listening <laughs> excuse me day after day and then the retreat would be over, and then the next retreat, she'd be there listening and listening and listening. And then, you know, one day, a bird called, she said, oh, I see. I got it now. <laughs> I see. But she didn't, she wanted to have, who is hearing was a con she wanted. She'd done the great, does a dog have Buddha nature or not? No, she'd done that one, and she felt like she got somewhere, and it was a fine koan, but she needed a different approach to the same problem. So, so, um, and there's something about, you know, dancing with the world. <laughs> um, here's an example of not dancing with the world. <laughs> uh, irrigation guy came around to visit me yesterday. It was a question in 
in Cal Northern California irrigation, but he came around to visit me and he was also talking about uh, traps, gopher traps, gophers, because um, gophers are very, you know, enthusiastic about eating trees and tree roots and things. They eat the roots and the trees die and stuff. And so he was talking about them and he said, he said how people get obsessed with them is sort of like um, a coyote and roadrunner that coyotes always sending away for explosives or devices from Acme Corporation to to blow up Roadrunner or something and going insane. So that consciousness, he says, is exactly the consciousness people get into around gophers in their gardens and farms. And he said, so he knew a farmer and the guy filled all that, plugged as many of the gopher holes you could see and filled it all with gas and then set the gas alight. And there's this huge explosion blew the trees in his farm out of the ground and so it was like it was just like coyote you know he just blew himself up and was all singed and <laughs> the thing he was trying to do was you know and so so that would be bothering the traffic <laughs> that would be not coming to terms with things and um when the sound takes you over, like if who is hearing, if you're hearing and the sound takes you over, you realize you don't have to be someone to participate in the world. And the more you decide, I'm this or I'm that, um, then you have a stance and you have to, whatever it is, blow up the gophers or <laughs> catch the road runner or send away to Acme Corp for yet more devices, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, and you have to um but but if you really just hear you realize oh there's just the sound is hearing the sound the world is hearing the world and I'm not I'm not apart from the world and I'm, you can tell there's a you go through what looks like loneliness. I'll just be here and listen, and nobody will help me. And I'm not asking for anything. I'm just here. And then you realize the whole world is holding you up. And so that, that loneliness that people get in autumn, it just, um, oh, it's transparent. And then you become the autumn yourself, and the leaves are falling through you. And the birds are going through you. Sound of tractors is going through you, the cars. So what I want to do now is sit for a bit, and we'll sit with the con. There are a lot of cons about hearing, you know. What's that sound? The voice of the raindrops is one of them, you know. But this is the ancient primeval con. Who is hearing? Who is hearing? Like most who koans, you just like sit with the wonder of it without trying to answer it. Because you notice any answer you get stops you hearing. So just, just listen to things. <laughs> like my friend in the back of the Zendo in Honolulu with the window open listening to the minor birds. The sound of the temple bell. The sound of your own being. And uh, the great Japanese novel, uh, novels Kawabata had a, I think maybe it was the title of the book was called The Sound of the Mountain. Someone kept hearing the mountain sound, the sound of the mountain. There's a koan that says, what is the sound of one hand? What is the song the stars are singing? like that you know so it, all the sounds of the world the world comes to us and we hear its music is another way to put it who is hearing so if you i'll be quiet for a bit and you can just um wonder about that without having to succeed at the task of finding out <laughs> who is hearing let's try the bell again <laughs> cunningly original sound there's an algorithm that turns the bell into conversation so you can't hear it so and it was off
nice to hear the bell.
Who is hearing? <laughs> Who is hearing the music and the silence after? And just let yourself fall into and be carried by the question. Who is hearing? One of the great fundamental koans, like what is my light, would be another one. Does a dog have Buddha nature? No. <laughs> Maybe another one. True person has no rank. That kind of con. But who is hearing? It's enough, you know, when we, the sound comes, it's enough. What is going on in, in your heart and mind is enough. We don't have to adjust it or fix it or improve it. So then the happiness is kind of involuntary actually, or at least we didn't, we didn't manufacture it. Who is hearing? You can tell when you didn't manufacture something because I can feel it now, the joy of the music, and it just, it just expands and there's no limit to it. And there's no limit, if you're listening, there's no limit to you either, you expand with it. It's all right, it's a good, it's a good life. <laughs> just to fully have this life. what the koans are for, who truly have it. You know, as you meditate, uh, you know, it deepens by itself, and so you don't have to push it down as if it's a cork and you need to keep it under. You just keep touching and question who is hearing. The meditation just unfolds by itself. Sounds come and peace comes. Ah, the bell again. Let me hear from a couple of people. I have some other stuff to say, but um, Alison Atwell. I was afraid you were going <laughs> to ask me first. Uh, let's see. Um, I was very struck by the story of your your friend and the Zendo, how um, even though the abbot of the temple had approved her her, her awakening or Kensha that um, that she was listening to the sounds of the world and that includes the sounds of your own heart and mind, your own inner experience. And it's not any different than hearing the outer sounds. And so in a way, um, she wasn't trying to in a way, her practice had had 
finally be actually begun because she was no longer looking outside herself for approval or or disapproval and um she wasn't looking for that internally either she was simply hearing hearing what was actually occurring and that was dis-ease in her own heart and mind and she wasn't trying to change it so i think in a way um that not trying to manipulate what other people are thinking or feeling and not trying to do it to ourselves. That's also when um, love appears. You know, that I, a couple of days ago, I um, was looking on a website for Christmas gifts and I just stumbled upon an advent calendar that had chocolates from Paris. And I thought, I got to get this for my daughter. This, when she was little, I would always get her an advent cal calendar, but never chocolates from Paris. So I ordered it and sent it. And then this morning, there was an email from my daughter, something about, you know, the chocolates had arrived or something. But immediately I could feel myself, um, part of my mind wanting to, get some like extract some sense of approval or from her or I was afraid to open it because she might not have given me enough approval and so I just didn't open it <laughs> and I I think that's also like hearing my own sounds my heart right then was not at rest and so I just didn't do anything and uh, it's waiting there in my inbox very good. Thank you. Rudy. <clears throat> yeah, hi. Um, I am appreciating your comments on synesthetic experiences. Um, as somebody who has explored consciousness in different ways, as a, a psychotherapist and uh, psychedelics and whatnot, and a longtime meditator, um, I don't do psychedelics anymore, but I do find that I have synesthetic experiences that are hard to explain to other people around me. And so it's very comforting to hear that meditators experience this. Um, for example, the other day I was feeling quite sad and my imagination created a cloud above my head and I could feel the weight of the cloud. And these words are not doing the experience justice because it was quite heavy and quite uncomfortable. And um, my sister walked in the room and she was feeling quite bad and I felt her cloud. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's it's funny reflecting on it, but in the moment- Whose it was cloud like, is it? You know, it's like that. <laughs> I'm um, feeling someone else's cloud sometimes, yeah. Keep yeah. going. <laughs> um, so what to say about it? Um, I'm 30 years old. I'm still learning to be a human and I'm experiencing quite a bit of anxiety in these new ways of sensory perception. And um, it's, it's just, it pleases me to know that other people experience this because I don't get many people to talk to about this and I get tired of talking to people that take psychedelics regularly because they have quite the stories to share <laughs> that seem nonsensical. And um, it is real. It is real that these things happen and um, it's hard to quantify and explain them. And I just appreciate somebody who's experienced in understanding the mind to talk about it. So thank you, John. Yeah, no, nice to hear from you. I don't think I've talked to you before, so welcome. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I think it's kind of incredibly common in a Zendo. So, you know, just to say, like, um, depressingly normal, you know, <laughs> so, so, but it's, I, uh, and a lot of people just have it naturally. I, I uh, know a woman who, the colors of the week, somebody mentioned the colors of the week, they always have a, the, the names of the days of the week, they always have a color, like for her Thursday is always gray, you know, which seemed a bit, <laughs> a bit uh, like that. But, and I noticed that like, um, I often have, um, remember when I, 
I was on a plane a lot and I often felt that sorrow of parting and it would always have it as a smell, a scent, the scent of flowers in airports always smelt like French penny for me. You know, I guess. And it was how I could tell I was a little sad to be leaving wherever I was leaving. You know, it was, it was uh, kind of sweet. So yeah, I think it, I think it's partly something just to welcome as part of the variety of what it is to be you and to be human and to be what it is to be you rather than what somebody else thinks you ought to be is one of the big uh, tasks of Zen. So, so keep it up with the synesthesia. <laughs> And I think uh, probably um, psychedelics make you more prone to it, but just meditation makes you prone to it. You know, so, thank you. Um, you know, Holly, Holly, you're on here somewhere. Do you want to say anything about either synesthesia or sounds, hearing sounds? I actually. Um... I actually feel them, feel sounds like when Michael plays. Um, it helps me disappear in a way. I mean, it, it uh, allows me to be big. So it's very sweet. And you had some, you've always had synesthesia from way before you got into meditation, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Actually, I think it might have, you know, the might have been one of the reasons that, that uh, I became a meditator, actually. Um, but what I've said to you recently is um, I don't feel I'm resistant, as resistant to it as I was. But uh, I'm not fighting. Yeah, I'm just seeing colors and hearing sounds and... Not yet a problem. Uh, kinesthetic synesthesia, which is um, where uh, other uh, movements or other people's bodies, if someone is touching themselves, I can feel it on my own body, um, which makes the world really interesting <laughs> and rich. Yeah. Good, thanks. Thank nice you. Um, and you can tell that the Cohen's, they just, they, they don't really mind whether you're synesthetic or not. They don't really mind. It's just like, it's a largeness of being human and how we contain it all. You know, what Whitman's, I contain multitudes, we contain it all. You know, so. um, uh, John Bennett, do you have anything to say? <laughs> um, I love that meditation at the beginning. So I have a persistent cold that seems unwilling or unready, at least, to go off and leave me and let me return to whatever normalcy was. But one of the effects of that is that it's clogged up my ears, so I can't hear very well. So this is a very interesting um, koan. And at the beginning, really, I was listening to the bloods flow in my body and funny little clicks in my ears and all these internal sounds. Um, and then you rang the bell in the, in the middle of the meditation and that it sounded like, I'll, I'll just say it, it sounded like the most beautiful sound in the universe. It was just this gorgeous, beautiful, soft, loving, cuddling kind of sound. It really kind of took me away. Um, and I, and do, the con you know, who is hearing? And I thought the universe is hearing. No, that's the sound of the universe. No, that's the universe making the sound and hearing the sound. And it was all, all blended together. And then the bell died out and, and I heard this distinctive popping sound from outside of my house. I know the sound, it's the sound of a rifle being fired some distance away. We have a herd of deer in the autumn that kind of lives in our orchard. We have an orchard outside this window I'm looking out. And, um, and I, it's a, a buck and a gaggle of does and a whole bunch of six and eight month old kids. And they're quite wonderful. And I, I couldn't help but hear this popping sound and then start worrying about our deer. You know? <laughs> I hope it's not any of them. And, and um, and then 
uh, the flute came along <laughs> and I was able to release the whole story and the whole narrative that had gotten going in my head about the deer and I hope they're okay and what's going on out there. And, and I, I'll, I won't go on, I won't blather on, but the, the, the flute, Michael's flute is so loving and gorgeous and gentle and soft and beautiful. And it was just, it was quite nice. So um, yeah, it was a, a bit of a journey in this meditation, but, but all good and all very, uh, you know, I don't know, comforting in some sense. Thank you. Nazneen, I believe you're just back from Haida Gwaii, which is one of those magical, legendary places. So I don't know if you, anything about hearing or about Haida or whatever. Yeah. Mm. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yeah, it, um, I don't know what to talk about Haida Gwaii, but the day I left Haida Gwaii, we were standing outside and I had four cookies to gingerbread to shortbread. And there is this big raven and it was just making the noise. And I know it knew that I had bread, shortbread cookies. So I gave him one and my coworker actually was pissed off that it's not, it's a sweet thing you shouldn't be giving it. And then today I was going outside and to shop and this raven came back here and it was making noises and it's kind of saying thank you and i said okay you don't have to thank me go home because it's snowing and it's kind of really sweet so yeah there is this thank you the raven <laughs> <laughs> very good john joseph do you have anything to say I'm, I'm really just listening to the sound of other people's stories. So great. I put story. Um, before COVID, we used to meet on Saturdays, one Saturday a month in um, San Mateo. And a um, small group was gathering one Saturday and uh, manager of the place called and he said, we're going to, uh, unfortunately, we're gonna um, we're gonna have to uh, do some chain sign in the floor below you and right out the window outside the window where you're meditating. And uh, I said okay. And uh, I didn't I didn't let anybody I didn't send an email around that said hey they're gonna chainsaw what is that okay? And uh, I thought well it'd be wonderful you know let's let's just try it and. Uh, so we started the meditation at like at nine and I was expecting to hear the chainsaws light up any second. <laughs> and I was sitting the first minute then the first five minutes then the first half hour and the chainsaws hadn't lit up in the second half hour. And what I found is sort of in my openness to the sound of the chainsaws, I was able to hear the children running around and yelling outside. And I was able to hear the, the traffic go by in this, in this way that John Bennett said, you know, just this beautiful intimacy um, of, of just those ordinary sounds. So it was kind of a nice, no chainsaw moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> okay, meditation, more meditation.
and you can tell like it's enough isn't it just being here having the life you have with an old conversation it goes um, my name is Weijiao my name it let's say my name is Jane I ask you what is Buddha and teacher said you are Jane And so we're feeling it, we hear, every time we hear, that's what it is. Buddha has no <coughs> shoulders, no hands, no ears, no heart, other than yours. Bells come. Traffic, chainsaws, ravens. Coyotes at night. <clears throat> Just here, this is the sound of life, of my life, of your life. And there's nothing else, there's no other moment that's the best moment. <laughs> still, this moment is still the best after all these years. <laughs> and whatever appears, whatever sound appears, whatever appears is, is a sound, then, you know, <clears throat> you know, the thing with meditation is just don't fight it. And then don't have a view about it, really. And then it does what it came for. Or it does whatever it does. And we feel it in our hearts. <clears throat> That's good enough. Excellent. And just... The whole, be whole world comes through us and meets us. And then we can feel the world through our own hearts. <clears throat> when the 10,000 things advance and meet us, that is awakening. <clears throat> And that's an old con. When we advance and meet the 10,000 things, when we're chasing after them, hmm, that's called delusion. It's got its value too, but um, it's nice when the 10,000 things advance and meet you. <laughs> I've just arrived at this temple. How should I enter the way? And the teacher said, do you hear the sound of the mountain stream? Yes, I do. Enter there. Enter here. Whatever is happening, it is your doorway and your gateway. If you're bored, enter here. <laughs> Thinking, I wonder what I'll have for lunch after this. You know. <laughs> enter the, in the wondering. Ah, that's just the same as who is hearing? Who is hearing? You notice how that's the beginning of resting in wonder, resting in the not knowing and how <clears throat> marvelous.
course it is, that not knowing supports you and wonder supports you. Who is hearing then starts to open out infinitely. Here's a poem by, uh, this is Seamus Heaney. And he's talking about one of the remote islands. Uh, I think in Ireland. Um, it's called The Given Note. On the most westerly blasket in a dry stone hut, he got this air out of the night. Strange noises were heard by others who followed bits of a tune coming in on loud weather. Though nothing like melody, he blamed their fingers and ears as unpractised, their fiddling easy, for he had gone alone into the, for he had gone alone into the island and brought back the whole thing. The house throbbed like his full violin. So whether he calls it spir spirit music or not, I don't care. He took it out of the wind off mid-Atlantic. Still he maintains from nowhere, it comes off the gray bow, it comes off the bow gravely, rephrases, rephrases itself into the air. Still he maintains from nowhere, it comes off the bow gravely, rephrases itself into air. So, there we are, and the sounds that just appear in the world. Um, I think listening to, uh, you know, listening to the time is part of who is hearing, and part of the generosity of being alive and being a person on the path that we can't help but hear the time and the uneasiness and the difficulties of the time. And... Uh, and just to say, you know, the whole common meditation was developed in hard, in difficult times when people were doing foolish things and there's a lot of destruction and hatred in the air. And uh, the, I mean, the effects of the meditation are a mystery, but they're real and you can feel the mysterious power of them. And they're a mystery because um, <clears throat> they're outside of the center. We normally try to have a center for our personality and have all these opinions about who we are and what we like and how we're good at this and maybe we behave badly there and well there, and things like that. But uh, in meditation, everything goes deeper than that. And we don't need to have opinions about who we are. And, and so we don't need then to be... Uh, we, we can be open to what comes, you know. And uh, the door is strangely always at hand. You know, we just enter the moment. We open to what appears, to the sounds that appear, and the, who is hearing appears. And we don't need to hurry past the current moment in order to get to the next. That's what hearing is. Don't hurry past the current moment to get to the next. We're just here. And uh, then that expansion just comes out of us. So, so I was li I've been listening to the autumn a little bit, and um, uh, and just listening to the the first thing that happened. Uh, so I've been it's a kind of journal of really the psyche and who is hearing, I suppose. But one day in late spring, the golden crowned sparrows suddenly go to Alaska's. Alaskan summer's long, long days, taking their little fat bodies and leaving a silence. Little round bodies and leaving a silence. The day after the autumn equinox, their voices appeared in the garden. Just in from a far journey, golden crowned sparrows, skinny and singing. 
Uh, for them, as for us, it's a time of travail, surprise, and hard journeys, a momentous time. Uh, on the long hill across the road, I, I live in kind of, kind of among vineyards, among other things. Um, on the long hill across the road, the vi vineyard's leaves are in love with cadmium yellow deep. A spill or two of crimson, some lingering hunter's green, and Naples yellow, which has a bit of violet in it, like the evening. The birds make little galaxies of bright thoughts, swirling, dashing around, dashing through. A merlin, which is a kind of hawk, a merlin swimming through the branches, sleek and dangerous, hunting, hunting our friends, the singing sparrows. This life, too, is eternal, life after life, and being alive is a kind of art form. Vine leaves circle in an updraft, vine leaves circle in an updraft, wishing to become birds. There we are. They do that. Uh, so uh, we're going to do the four vows, but I just noticed somebody I haven't seen for a while and been wondering how he is and what's up. James Anthony. Looks like he's in on the Big Island. Do you have anything to say? No. <coughs> yeah, the next moment. <clears throat> After I clean the house this morning, then I can be awakened and hear the sounds. But right now, that's the only sound I can hear is kind of, are we there yet? <laughs> Am I arriving at a destination? Um, so thanks for the reminder that um, this is still the best moment. Yeah, the ocean is roaring. Thank you, John. Nice to see your face. <laughs> the uh, Thurber, the great cartoonist, has this great line, are we there yet, Daddy? Shut up, he explained. <laughs> okay, Amaryllis. I vow to wake all the beings of the world. I vow to set endless heartache to rest. I vow to walk through every wisdom gate I vow to live the great Buddha way I vow to wake all the beings of the world I vow to set Endless heartache to rest I vow to walk through every wisdom gate I vow to live the great Buddha way I vow to wait all the beings of the world I vow to set endless heartache to rest I vow to walk through every wisdom gate I vow to live the great Buddha way Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amaryllis. Thank you, thank you, everyone. You know, go online and um, <clears throat> see what we've, what's happening there. If you're not a member, there's a vast, you can become a member, there's a vast array of resources online for how to learn to meditation, get enlightened and live forever. So <laughs> in whatever form you live. <laughs> so have a good time with that. And also, if you want to donate money, we like that. We're for that because we like keeping the show going. So, and we love that. And um, uh, what else? Um, that's it. Oh, next week, uh, there'll be some, there'll be kind of a meeting with teachers and stuff. And so 
I won't be, nobody will be here next Sunday, so you'll all be free to find out who is hearing and listen all on your own and have a wonderful time. And then the next week I'll be back, so um, through uh, pretty much November and December.